Thank you very much. Um, first of all, Nick, that was terrific. That was really great. We've only met each other on, on the phone, actually, so it's great to see both Nick and Ed here, and their, their talks are really going to be fantastic. And mine is going to be one of these where I'm telling you how I got to be standing up here uh, talking to you about this. Uh, we did have the, um, the report, which uh, was issued in January, came to the RLUK board in February, and uh, I was uh, imprudent enough to say, well, it was a very long report with lots of, of uh, recommendations, and I thought perhaps we should be, and I think I probably did use the word radical, and everybody liked the fact that I was saying something radical about, about cataloging. And um, uh, now I'm not, you know, I'm not so sure that was a wise idea. And I made them uh, re rewrite the minutes, so it didn't say radical. <laughs> but at any rate, um, uh, what I wanted to say where, how I, what my credentials are that uh, allow me to stand up here in front of you and talk about this. So when I was um, in in college. Uh, I had a part-time job one year pasting labels in a book collection that had been um, given to the, to the uh, college. And I was there in the midst of their technical services operations. And I, I, I just, this is not the library. The, the color picture is the library. Oh, I see. We've got another one. Um, uh, but I was working in a technical services operation that looked a little bit like that. Um, and I, I was naive enough to say one day to the head of technical services, well, don't you find it depressing, you know, all these books that are, are there? And she said, oh, no, you get used to it. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and I thought, well, I don't know if I'm ever going to get used to it. So then I went on to um, Harvard. I, I, my first job after I, after I graduated was working uh, first because I could alphabetize. Uh, I was alphabetizing cards that would go into the catalog. Uh, just in case you've forgotten what a card catalog <laughs> looks like or a card, um, do, making these kinds of cards and uh, filing them, filing them into the card catalog. And, and there, actually, I had my first brush with automation, which was when OCLC was um, coming into being. And um, Harvard used OCLC like a giant electronic uh, typewriter, uh, basically. And it, it, it just uh, did. So that was the next uh, cataloging thing. Then I went uh, to, uh, I had a few other stops around the way, but I left those out. Um, and eventually, I ended up at the Library of Congress as a director for cataloging. And so that's really what gives me my credentials. Uh, I had um, 800 catalogers <laughs> working for me. And, um, and they, were, they, were, they were quite glorious in their, in their, in their own way. I tried, <laughs> I tried not to reveal that I, I couldn't cite rules. Um, and and uh, coming through here, uh, coming on the, on the train on the way up here, and we passed through York, and I, I felt myself get tense because I went to an, an Anglo-American cataloging uh, steering committee meeting in York one time. And, and I thought, oh, I cannot reveal that the director of cataloging is so ignorant about AACR. But one of the things that I found at the Library of Congress was uh, I had very highly professional catalogers who were doing enormous quality review in order to produce the National Union catalog. But now we had gotten to the point of, of automation, but we were still clinging to the procedures that had allowed us to defend the quality of our work by having, uh, you know, 11 quality reviews done by people who were highly trained because we hadn't yet made the shift to thinking we were in a very dynamic uh, world where we could, if we made a mistake in a, in a record, we, we could change it. So that, that sort of uh, inflexibility was uh, still deeply embedded in us in the, in the Library of Congress. I then moved to there. I'm leaving out a lot, actually, but um, uh, moved to uh, Cornell University, 
where uh, there was a lot of opportunity for uh, creativity and, and innovation. But one of the things that prepared me for Oxford it was that it, had, it was an organization with multiple libraries and actually multiple libraries that were administratively separate. And so in, uh, in an organization with 21 libraries, I had seven different uh, cataloging operations. And uh, one of the things there that I did uh, was a, a, a review, and I, I have to credit Karen Calhoun, um, with, who was the uh, AUL for Technical Services at the time, with really putting a lot of this into place, was uh, reviewing our costs, reviewing our practices and reviewing our costs. And so what I could show was that in central technical services it cost us $8 to catalog an item, in the ag library it cost 13 and in the law library it cost 17 And although people argued, oh well, law publications, you know, they're much more complicated and, you know, there were lots of apples and oranges arguments about it. The fact was when we began standardizing on what we did, we saved, um, I don't know, 11 percent of our positions and we were able to repurpose them for, for other points, for other activities. Uh, so moving on, uh, thinking about another, these are the sorts of things that have influenced me in my career, influenced the thinking and the recommendations you're going to see from me. Uh, is that our users actually want barrier-free access, and they're, they're very used to uh, open online sources. I've got archive clipped down there at the bottom because uh, while I was at Cornell, uh, Paul Ginsberg came from Los Alamos, and I uh, really uh, was pretty aggressive about wanting archive to be supported in the library. And the idea that you could have an open access um, activity that was uh, for the benefit of the world and not just for your own local good was, uh, was a really um, a deeply held value. The other thing that we found, of course, that were influencing people, um, the idea of being able, the, the same sort of openness that users wanted to be able to get access to collections anywhere they were and in the in the in North America and the Ivy League institutions and then now it's expanded we had something called borrow direct where we shared our collections and we had um, uh, unmediated borrowing that means it didn't go through ILL well one of the ways one of the tools obviously that was critically important there was the catalog and the ability for people to be able to to find things and then I think we're all deeply influenced by Amazon probably nothing much to have to say to that or Google the fact that our uh, users when we're talking about user needs that people uh, deal, they have a high degree of tolerance for uh, a lot of ambiguity in their, in their results. And we spend a lot of time in libraries trying to have the authoritative record where our, our users are really kind of voting with their feet uh, doing uh, other types of searches. And I, I, I collect these headings. This is an old one. Uh, old, the old search engine the library tries to fit in the Google world. I mean, we've been talking about this a long time now, that it's, it's very uh, difficult for us to uh, adapt in some ways uh, some of our practices, but we need to be thinking about where the majority of people are heading. And we also need to think about what's happening with our content. And uh, this is one that stayed with me for a long time. This is from 2005, the British Library Report on 2020. And uh, the, the, the print universe uh, right now in the UK, we estimated 150,000. This is from legal deposit figures. And by 2020, 50% of UK monographs would be electronic. By 2020, 70% of UK serials would be electronic. That's from seven years ago. Maybe the data was collected eight years ago. I actually don't know what the figures are. Maybe David knows. He's sort of smiling like a Cheshire cat. Maybe he knows. But um, if anything, it's probably more than that. And um, so, you know, here, now I'm at the Bodleian. Uh, 
the closed gate maybe is um, <laughs> symbolic in some some way. Uh oh, and I say I have a typo on the next slide. But um, uh, what we're trying to do is open things up, and so here uh, it's crowdsourcing <laughs> um, is taking our our um, and as Rolly described with the maps, for example, but taking our our uh, scores. We've digitized uh, s thousands of scores, put them up, and asked people to help describe them. Um, I, this is a project that's very near and dear to my heart, uh, but I have to say when I conceived it, what I was thinking about was, oh, we'll get these scores that we have, we'll invite people to... Um, all those music buffs out there will describe it, and it was sort of my version of Huck Finn. I mean, you wouldn't need to be cataloging them anymore. But of course, I can't do all the work on this project myself, and it sort of morphed into something that's far more detailed. It's morphed into people with music cataloging background trying to make the you know music cataloging records into it. So we've we've done. Um, 12% of the collection has been completed in four months. Now, actually, it's probably much more than that because we don't count it as completed until the record's been touched like five different times. So it could, could be a higher number. But it hasn't been the example of uh, runaway success. Put your, slides, your, your scores up and uh, they're done in 10 minutes by the power of all the people around the world. But I wouldn't say that it's a... Um, I wouldn't say it's a failure because I do think it's a real lesson learned. I think the potential remains there and we should keep this in mind as we look at our hidden collections and uh, some of our other uh, enriching our, our existing records. All right, so now in I think what we're seeing and, and, and Nick's slide about 6% uh, original cataloging um, was was I think fitting into this we we're we're, we're seeing a, overall a decline in local cataloging our collections are becoming uh, much more overlapping as we buy uh, bundles we're buying fewer foreign titles so more English fewer foreign titles we're doing more copy cataloging we're receiving more shelf ready and uh, the e-resources are arriving with companion metadata. And even if that's um, uh, not yet fully um, implementable in the way that we would like it, that's certainly the trend that we're looking at. And we're moving in a, in a trend that's moving away from manual handling and into first copy cataloging, outsourcing, shelf ready, and our patron driven acquisitions also tends to put us in that way. So I'm going to be talking in a minute about cultural shift, but I was, I was going um, when I was putting the talk together to see if I could find some good illustrations about um, shelf ready. And I got a, a bit distracted because I found uh, a blog, um, the Dark Side of the Catalog blog, and um, someone who had been to a conference and was hearing the gospel about Shelf Ready. And uh, this person writes, as, as a cataloger, I'm very concerned over this loss of control of classification and bibliographic standards, which I was sad to see didn't matter to some people at this event. One speaker admitted they didn't really check the records when the books arrived and that they weren't particularly bothered if such details as pagination or authors or editors were correct. I was too stunned at this point to comment on the day, and my colleagues were horrified. So you, you have that. And then another little remark in this person's blog was, um, and, and this is one of the things that she thought was, was regrettable, um, which is um, about shelf-ready cataloging. We spend most of our time at computers and we don't see many books. And I have to say it is kind of an occupational hazard sometimes working in a library. When I, when I became a cataloger, I, I sort of stopped reading because you were supposed to churn those b books out. You weren't supposed to linger lovingly over them. Uh, so there is going to be a happy note at the end of this in, in terms of what I think we have opportunities to, to do. But as we were 
uh, reviewing this rather dense report, uh, I thought that perhaps one of the most important things that we could do to collectively, now this is, uh, David was saying he's hoping we'll, um, you know, give some, some guidance. And I think about the work that was done uh, last year on negotiating for uh, better prices in, in the relationship with publishers, and that was collective action that came together. And I wonder if there isn't some scope for us in collective action, and that's in making this cultural shift. Uh, I, I think the person who, who laments the uh, loss of attention on certain details in the cataloging record, I mean, that's a very genuine concern. Obviously, no one likes to see errors in, in a record, but I wonder if we don't have other ways of dealing with those errors as they're discovered rather than um, putting so much effort on the front end of making the record, um, you know, if we can get them into our system and be continually upgrading them through other means. So in order to do that, you need to have some kind of acceptance of standardization. And what I see all the time, I mean, within Oxford, people are, uh, so before I came, so six years ago, people adopted a Library of Congress classification. After I'd been, been there for one year, uh, the, the person in charge of technical services came to me and said, Sarah, do you think we should begin implementing this? And I thought, oh, oh, they haven't done that yet. Oh, okay. So then, now we are still fighting about it. I mean, people think it is going to be the death knell to scholarship if we all use uh, Library of Congress classification. And yet, um, there are so many other... Um, I, I don't actually care what classification system we use, but I don't want to have 17 local instantiations of it. And so I think we need to cease our local customization for classification, local sort of authority, control quirks, other access points and description. I mean, it might be um, the future is, it's, it's year zero, it's the future is, is longer than the past, perhaps. Uh, I do think we need to facilitate the ability to ingest records created elsewhere, and that again gets back to your Aleph point, Nick. Um, well, how would we do this? I think we need to be able to talk effectively about the savings that could be achieved and the values and uh, to scholars and students of having the collections accessible faster. So, um, it, if you think back to my slide about the different libraries at Cornell and the different costs of cataloging, I was able to go around to the deeds of the various schools and show them the, the, the savings that were going to be made by having greater uniformity. And getting things onto uh, so that people can find them faster is definitely a real advantage. Um, I think if we the, the best thing, though, isn't to say how much money we can save. It's to hold up other, other goals that are so much more desirable than having 100% uh, of the uh, paginations correct on, a, on, a, on our catalog records the first time around. And so then I think we can do that. Then people have a real motivation for change because they can see that uh, the money is going to go to a very higher, high priority. We, we work now in all of our organizations, I think, with an increasingly mobile population. Uh, Two-thirds of the graduate uh, population at Oxford is international. They've all come from another environment. And so we need to make their transitions uh, more seamless. I'd like to see that. And, um, and then just all the ways that we have to communicate this uh, so that we can move people to a different place instead of lamenting the loss of quality, think about all that we're going to be able to offer people in, in instead. Just to say, I mean, we used to, at the Library of Congress, I fought to get uh, some of the 
what was essentially copy cataloging moved from professional catalogers down into lower graded trained staff. At universities, I've tried to move it to students. I've tried to move it to the lowest uh, level possible with some quality control. I, I mean, I'm, I'm proud of what we do. I don't mean that we have trash. But I think that inevitably, if you get a trained person looking at something, they want to edit it. And so we want to um, avoid that. Well, having ebooks makes it easier uh, not to do that. Well, how do we increase the amount of either uh, shelf ready or ebooks? Well, we should be talking to our vendors and telling them where we have priorities and encouraging them to create more e content rather than um, just uh, uh, waiting for them to come up with, with things and have intuitive interfaces. So here, Shelf Ready, I've, I've really uh, said the supporting vendors who supply the service um, and, and be proactive about publications where we would benefit from having that. Uh, shared service. Now this was an idea, a recommendation, uh, the service, the Shared Service Bureau. If you can have, uh, especially as uh, maybe foreign language uh, competency is diminishing. Uh, we can't afford to have it uh, in the same uh, level across all of our institutions. Well, we can buy into it at, at two or three sites where we can make that available. Uh, we can have the original cataloging concentrated in an organization where there's depth of experience. Um, I, I do bang on about standards, even though I accept the fact that sometimes there may be um, ways to, to counter that. And then, if you're going to set up a service bureau, it obviously has to meet uh, standards of its own. So it has to have KPIs and um, um, be delivering those things. We need to be able to share the knowledge of RLUK holdings, and um, um, Nick has already talked about that in terms of the pilot that's going on right now. And um, did I skip that? No, that's all right. And then uh, this, to me, is is one of the great prizes for us for making change, and that is to be able to provide increased access to our unique and distinctive collections. Here again, though, we need to think about how we can uh, provide the most for the effort that we invest in it. Uh, we, we cannot do that at a, uh, a level that produces um, you know, one record a week or something like that. We need to, we need to be able to do to do more. We need to be able to educate. I've been on the UDC uh, group and uh, so it's a question of educating our university administrators on the value of, of unique and, and distinctive collections. Um, we need to be able to figure out a business case that allows us to sustain them and then we need to expose them. And what, what else do we want to be doing? We want to be doing research data. Uh, the ability uh, on the, this is is something I found, which is a visualization of Wikipedia edits in, in Wikipedia as big data, and then the uh, the circle is the work that's being done um, at Oxford uh, relating to to data. So that we need to be able to do data management and work in that area. And so uh, this is really just summing up what we would like. This is talking about some of the, um, I went to this summer at IFLA, uh, an ex Libris conference, and Lee Dirks, who is sadly no longer with us, presented a, a very stimulating, it might have been his last presentation, about, um, big, about data and data curation. And I commend it to you in its entirety. It's 64 slides long. But he has a, a, a tremendous section on sort of new jobs for librarians, emerging roles. And here, the, this is the trend line for data steward. So I bet if you map the trend line for catalogers, um, it might be going in the, in the other direction. But look, there is a, another future. Here's 
looking about the kind of expertise that's needed for digital uh, humanities and social sciences. And it is this ability to describe things and have them be discovered. Gaps in supporting um, evolving researchers' needs, data management and curation is important. And um, yeah, and uh, over here, metadata, need to advocate and advise on the use of metadata. And then uh, Lee's last slide, what will our future like? And we've got evolved librarians, technical professionals, proactively engaged with data producers. So it's, it's moving more upstream to the creation, but getting the description in there. So it's, it's a, I see this as a pathway for us from the type of work we're doing now. And then I leave you with a slide for the season and what we can do with our National Union catalogs. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> and thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.